All right, class. Hopefully you had a good enough break there. Let's start with neural control of voluntary movement. So we need some kind of mechanism where the brain says, okay, you know, time to contract those quads, time to contract those hamstrings. So muscle contraction results from stimulation by the nervous system. And every muscle fiber is innervated by a somatic motor neuron, which is, when appropriate, the stimulus is provided results in a muscle contraction. Okay, now if you have damage to these motor neurons, then obviously you cannot have a muscle contraction. So, the stimulus may be processed in varying degrees at different levels of the central nervous system, or CNS. CNS may be divided into five levels of control. So you got the cerebral cortex, which is the highest level of control. Then you get basal ganglia, cerebellum, brainstem, and spinal cord, which is the lowest level. So meaning an injury to the spinal cord wouldn't be as damaging to the patient or athlete as a damage to the cerebral cortex. Do you see how that works? Now, before we go any further, I wanted to uh, kind of share this with you that you, most of you have this circadian rhythm. So this is a good way to kind of do an icebreaker this morning as you guys wake up here. But your lowest body temperature is around 4.30 in the morning. Uh, your sharpest rise in blood pressure is about 6.45 in the morning. That's why most heart attacks usually happen within early in the morning, 6 to 7-ish, okay? About 7.30, your melatonin secretion stops. So even if you don't have like an alarm clock, you guys naturally wake up. And some of you at 7.30, some of you at 6.30, it just depends on, now this could deviate from one to two hours. Usually when you, after you wake up, you're like, you know what, I should go to the bathroom. So you go to the bathroom. So you have a bowel movement likely around 8.30. You're like, Patel, I've got class uh, at eight. I can't go poop. And then I uh, will have to wait. Well, that, you know, you guys figure it out. But usually in the morning, you have some kind of bowel movement, right? Now here's an interesting fact. Your highest testosterone secretion is nine o'clock. So you can do one of two things. You can go to the gym and do your lifting around nine o'clock or make babies you know the choice is yours uh, <laughs> uh, but yeah if i were going to lift i'd lift early in the morning around not six o'clock in the morning okay so some of you lift too early uh really you're again this is a pretty good mechanism if you have a normal circadian rhythm for humans now some of your circadian rhythms are totally off so i won't yeah i'm sure there's outliers and there's exceptions to the rule but for most people, the highest testosterone is around 9 o'clock. Now, your highest alertness is 10. So guess what? By you taking this class at 10 o'clock is the best because I have you on high alert. So uh, in the future, try to take your toughest classes around 9, 10, or 11. So taking your like chemistry or physiology or anatomy around 10 is great. Don't take it in the afternoon because that's not when your highest uh, alert. Okay, so noon, probably eat around there. Your best coordination is around 2.30. That's why after school sports uh, works really well because 2.30, your fastest reaction time is around 3.30. So participating in after school sports around 2.30, 3.30 is fantastic. Now here's something uh, interesting is your greatest cardiovascular efficiency and muscle strength is around five o'clock. So if you want to do cardio, it probably makes sense to do it later in the evening. So you're breaking up your uh, lifting in the morning and your cardio in the afternoon. That might be good. Okay, and then your highest blood pressure and highest body temperature starts to wean down. So five, six, around seven, and then seven, eight, nine, ten. Your melatonin starts to secrete around ten, nine, ten, and then you're no longer really going to have a bowel movement after about ten thirty, eleven, unless you ate six tacos for a dollar. Uh, right? <laughs> so it's a very interesting circadian rhythm. And the reason I share this with you is because we're talking about the central nervous system and how everything is regulated. And when things are not regular, then that's where things can go wrong. Now, like you said, some of you that work the night shift, you, your circadian rhythm might be totally opposite. Or those that uh, wake up later, then you're just pushing everything back. So this is just for a normal person that follows this circadian rhythm. Uh, uh, but, <laughs> it, and we'll talk about where in the brain this is uh, controlled as well. So again, the cerebral cortex has the highest, highest level of control, provides for the creation of voluntary movement as aggregate muscle action, but not as a specific muscle activity. Interprets sensory stimuli from a body to agree to which, 
determine the needed responses. So again, it's not real specific, but it is the highest level control. So that's a good quiz question there. Now the basal ganglia is the next lower level. Controls maintenance of postures and equilibrium. Controls learned movements such as driving a car. Controls sensory integration for balance and rhythmic activities. So balance, control learning movements, basal ganglia. The cerebellum is a major integrator of sensory impulses, so provides feedback relative to motion, controls timing and intensity of muscle activity. So here's a good example. What happens is the cerebral cortex tells me that I want to run from point A to point B, but the, basal, the cerebellum will say, okay, well, how fast am I going to run? Am I going to run in a straight line? Am I going to run backwards? And uh, how's the balance? So the cerebellum will start fine-tuning this control that the cerebral cortex says, I need to run from point A to point B. Now you're seeing the mechanisms, right? Gross motor control to more specific. Now the brain stem is very important because it integrates all central nervous activity through excitation and inhibition of desired neuromuscular functions. It contains all the remaining nerves throughout the body. Function is in arousal or by maintaining a wakeful state. So I say, hey buddy, stay awake here. And now the spinal cord, common pathway between central nervous system and peripheral, but that's the most specific control. The spinal cord is going to tell you to pick up a pen. It's going to tell you to curl your toes, right? So that is very specific. Integrates very simple and complex spinal reflexes. But if you have an injury just to the spinal cord, well, I mean, you can still function, right? Uh, and but just you might lose fine motor control here and there so it, it kind of makes sense uh now you understand the level of control that it takes to just perform a regular squat to walk to run now in order to fully comprehend how the brain works we have to relate to something that uh, is relatable like alcohol so <laughs> When you think about this, uh, let's talk about the level of control. So the first area of compromise is the cortex. So remember, that's the highest level of control. And in alcohol, guess what? That is what is affected first. So when you have one drink per hour, it causes a little confusion, lowers your inhibitions, your terrible jokes will start to seem funny, and you're less afraid to talk to new people or sing bad karaoke. Then it goes from the basal ganglia to the cerebellum, and that's going to alter your movement and balance. Okay, so that's when you fall off the stage after singing said karaoke, and your voice starts to slur. So this is about two to three drinks in one hour. If you keep drinking, it affects the hypothalamus and the amygdala. That's when crying fits happen and people injure themselves, but don't realize it until the next day. This is about four drinks an hour. At this point, the person is acting on animal instinct alone since all parts of the brain regulating reasoning have gone offline. If you still add more alcohol, now this is five to six drinks an hour, it can affect the brain stem a little bit, okay, which induces sleep and cause irregular breathing and even seizures. This is how one, even one binge event can lead to the untimely death. Fortunately, most drinking now where they pass out before it really gets to this level so again now you understand the mechanism you understand how the brain works now you understand how alcohol works and it goes just takes it down from the cortex to the cerebellum to the hypothalamus to the brainstem okay so next time you're at the bar or doing a pickup it's like oh yes i see that you're up to the cerebellum how are you doing today <laughs> I don't know. Patel is trying to help you in life, man. Trying to get a date for you. Uh, all right. Now, neural control of voluntary movement, peripheral nervous system, or the PNS. Functionally, the PNS is divided into sensory and motor dimensions. Sensory or afferent nerves bring impulses from receptors in skin, joint, muscles, and other peripheral aspects of the body to the central nervous system. Motor or Efferent nerves carry impulses to outlying regions of the body from the central nervous system. So here's basically all the nerves, right? The cervical plexus, you have the brachial plexus. When we talk about shoulder, injuries to the brachial plexus uh, um, are very interesting. And uh, overhead athletes, even baseball pitchers, you really have to be careful of the brachial plexus. 
Here's all the cervical nerves. Again, this is just a review of anatomy. Here's your thoracic nerves, the lumbar plexus, the sacral plexus, um, the most coveted, right? The sciatic nerve, one of those things that we have to really be careful with if you have low back pain. Okay, now you're saying, do I need to memorize all these? I uh, kind of have a general idea of what's what. Um, you don't have to be as specific, but having a general idea of these nerves is good. Uh, keep an eye out for the study guide, which will guide you in the right direction. Provide both motor and sensory function for their respective portions and name for the location from which they exit. So if they exit, that would be the T9, right? If they exit that T8 depending on where they exit, they're named. So here's a good quiz question. You have eight cervical nerves, you have 12 thoracic nerves, five lumbar, five sacral, one coccygeal. Now remember, we only have seven cervical vertebrae, but we actually have an extra cervical nerve. So that makes for awesome quiz question because that's an outlier, right? Remember, we eat breakfast at seven, uh, lunch at 12, dinner at five, but here we actually had an extra <laughs> nerves so make sure you know the difference between cervical vertebrae and nerves now cervical nerves one through four they form the cervical plexus so supplies motor innervation to several muscles of the neck so if you had injury to cranial nerves one through four then you'd have trouble moving your neck so this is what i want you to really know uh, generally responsible for sensation from the upper part of the shoulders to the back of the head and the front of the neck. So knowing that <clears throat> cervical nerves one through four control some muscles of the neck and then it provides sensation from the upper part of the shoulders to the back of the head is, is really what I want you to know. Now cervical nerves five through eight and thoracic nerve one, they form the brachial plexus, supplies motor and sensory function to the upper extremity and most of the scapula. Then we get into the thoracic nerves, 2 through 12 run directly to the specific anatomical locations. So all lumbar sacral and coccygeal nerves form the lumbosacral plexus, which supplies sensation and motor function to the lower trunk, the entire lower extremity, and the perineum. Okay, so this is good stuff that you should just, again, it's just all review from anatomy. Sensory function of the spinal nerves is to provide feedback to the central nervous system regarding skin sensation, meaning did you get a cut? Did somebody hit you? Is there spiders on your skin? A dermatone is a defined area of skin supplied by a specific spinal nerve. So one nerve will be responsible for a specific, specific area. That's called a dermatome. Um, so if you look at this, here is... So C2 provides sensation for the entire back of your head. C2 provides sensation for your neck here. C4 is your shoulders. So meaning if you have damage to C4, you might not feel anything on both of your shoulders. So if a patient comes in and says, you know, I don't feel anything on the near my pinky or the outside of my hand, then you're thinking, okay, well, then maybe he's got damage to the cervical eight, right? Or if someone says, hey, I don't feel the inside of my thigh, then you're thinking, okay, it might damage to L3. So this is something that you definitely should look at and you can grossly kind of figure out what's wrong with them. Okay, so definitely know this. Um, I think it'll be beneficial. Know all the major ones, especially in the legs and the arms because for athletes and sports, we are more concerned with this and this. I won't ask too much on the trunk per se, like T2, T3, but the C's and the L's you should definitely know. Now, myotone is a muscle or group of muscles supplied by a specific spinal nerve. Okay, so myotone, know the difference between a dermatone and a myotone. And certain spinal re nerves are also responsible for reflexes. So the way that a reflex works is basically you hit this, here's a reflex hammer, you get a quick stretch on this patellar tendon. The body says, oh, if I do a quick stitch, you can damage this tendon. So what the reflex is to actually kick your knee out and protect it. So perfect example is if you're just kind of staring at the screen and you're kind of nodding your head and your, your, your neck kind of falls all of a sudden like you're going to fall asleep. Well, what happened is your neck muscles got a quick sudden stretch and they're like, oh, if I keep going, I'm going to damage my neck. So all of a sudden you jerk up and then you wake up and says, oh, Patel's looking at me. I better, I better pay attention, right? That's why some of you have your screen turned off so that just in case your, your head kind of nods down, then I can't see you. You see? 
You learn something every single day here. Merry Christmas. <laughs> or Happy Hanukkah. Happy Holidays. You know, PC, PC, I know. Okay. Basic functional units of the nervous system responsible for generating and transmitting impulses consist of a neural cell body, one or more branching projections known as dendrites, which transmit impulses to the neuron and cell body, an axon, which is an elongated projection that transmits impulses away from the ner cell bodies. So this is very good to see that, hey, this is what a neuron or a nerve cell is. Now remember, you have two types of cells in your brain. You have a neuron and you have glial cells. A neuron does not undergo mitosis. That means that they cannot regenerate. So once you lose a neuron, unfortunately, that's it. C'est la vie. Okay, so neurons are classified into three types. So you have motor neurons, you have sensory neurons, so motor is movement, sensory is sensation, and interneurons, they connect, okay? Most of the nerves in your central nervous system uh, are interneurons. They're connecting one or the other. So sensory neurons transmit impulses to the spinal cord and the brain from all parts of the body. Motor neurons transmit impulses away from the brain and spinal cord to the muscle and glandular tissue. Interneurons are central or connecting neurons that conduct impulses from sensory neurons to motor neurons. So again, interneurons are found the most and they're really responsible for connecting neurons that conduct impulses from sensory neurons to motor neurons. So that's very important. Activity performance is significantly dependent upon neurological feedback from the body. We use various senses to determine response to our environment seeing when to lift our hand, to catch a flying ball. So sports, like I said, being a very efficient or a very good athlete requires proprioception, kinesthetics. Uh, uh, um, the neural system has to play a key role if you want to be an elite athlete. Sensations associated with neuromuscular activity through proprioception are taken for granted, right? So you guys really don't uh, realize it until something goes wrong. You have proprioceptors such as internal receptors located in the skin, joints, muscles, and tendons that provide constant feedback relative to the length of the muscle, the tension of the muscle, the contraction state, the position of the body, the limbs, and movements of joints. And you're thinking, because we just go to the gym and we're just like building, building, building and doing something. But really the neuromuscular control, I can't stress this enough, is actually what will determine how good you are as an athlete. The neuromuscular control will determine how well you'll do in rehab. So we spend a lot of time in rehab on neuromuscular control. Now, proprioceptors work in combination with other sense organs to accomplish kinesthesis or kinesthesis. Okay, so make sure you know the definition of kinesthesis. That's the conscious awareness of the position and movement of the body in space. So if you have poor kinesthesis, you're going to be more subjective to ankle sprains. Because every time you jump up in the air, you don't know where your ankle is in space. So then what you may land is you might land on the inside of your instep. Now, if you land on someone's ankle, that's just a freak accident and ankle sprains that happen that way, unfortunately. But if you don't know where your ankle is in space, then you're more prone to ankle sprains. So from a neuromuscular standpoint, doing proprioception and kinesthetic training with people with chronic ankle sprains is very beneficial. Now, what are the proprioceptors specific to the muscles? You've got the muscle spindles and the GTOs. Uh, you have some <laughs> proprioceptors that are specific to joints and skin. You've got Meisner's, Ruffini's, uh, Pacinian, and the Krause's end bulbs. And these have different uh, functions as to what they actually detect. Now, proprioception is the subconscious mechanism by which body is able to regulate posture and movement by responding to stimuli originating in proprioceptors of the joints, tendons, muscles, and inner ear. So the ear plays a role. So concentrated primarily, the muscle spindles are in the muscle belly between the fibers. Sensitive to stretch and rate of stretch, they insert into the connective tissue within muscle and run parallel with muscle fibers. Number of spindles varies depending upon level of control needed. The greater concentration of muscle spindles in the hands than in the thighs, of course, 
okay because we need <laughs> we have much better control of our hand than our thigh fine motor control now muscle spindles and myotatic or stretch reflex rapid muscle stretch occurs impulse is sent to the central nervous system cns activates motor neurons in the muscle and cause it to contract rapid stretch rapid stretch okay so you can use this to your advantage so let's think about when you jump right you kind of do kind of bend down quickly and then go straight up so you get a quick stretch and then bam Qu quick stretch to the quads quick stretch to the glutes and then phew, bam just fire it up okay so an example is you, the most simple one is the knee jerk or the patellar tendon reflex the reflex hammer strikes the patellar tendon causes a quick stretch of the musculoskeletal unit of the quads in response the quads fires and the knee extends the more sudden the tap the more significant the reflexive contraction see that's why some of you don't have a reflex because you're anticipating it you already know it's coming it's better when you don't know it's coming and then boom the central nervous system uh, uh, just responds naturally that's why some of you say oh I don't have reflexes that's impossible that's, everybody has reflexes but what happens is your brain is overpowering the reflex so that's why you got to figure out a way to not uh, concentrate on it so here's that knee jerk or patella tendon reflex now 